This lecture covers information from Chapter 17 of your textbook on nutrition and upper gastrointestinal disorders. Xerostomia is a condition that can have an impact on nutrition status. It is dry mouth and is caused by reduced salivary flow. With type 2 diabetes mellitus, when it is poorly controlled or when an individual has very high blood glucose, it will cause thirst and dehydration. Uh, I had a patient in my hospital days who had experienced um, throat cancer. He had radiation to get rid of the cancer and as a result he had reduced salivary flow. He was working with speech therapy um, to try to safely swallow food again. Certain medications can cause dry mouth as can an autoimmune condition called Sjogren's syndrome. Radiation therapy to the head or neck area um, will lead to xerostomia. Having dry mouth will increase malnutrition risk because uh, reluctance to eat or inability to um, soften food enough to safely swallow um, can result in you eating fewer calories, getting less protein. Additionally, dry mouth is associated with dental diseases. In order to manage dry mouth, there are a lot of products on the market, sugar-free gum, um, if you can safely chew gum is available and stimulate salivary flow in some individuals. Um, sucking on ice cubes as tolerated or frozen desserts like popsicles uh, can help to relieve dry mouth. There are mouthwashes. Biotene has a number of products out there. And Aura Moist, which is a dry mouth patch. So there are a number of products on the market now that um, weren't available even um, eight years ago. The consequences of xerostomia can include severe tooth decay, such as increased plaque on the teeth, uh, certain gum diseases, infections, dry mouth can sometimes interfere with speech. It's hard to talk when you do not have fluid circulating in your mouth. Uh, bad breath, difficulty chewing and swallowing, um, and this can be due to the absence of fluid in your mouth, or it can be due to dental decay that is a result of dry mouth. Diminished taste is associated with xerostomia, as are denture ulcers. Dysphagia is a condition referred to as inability to swallow or difficulty swallowing. Dysphagia refers to the inability to successfully pass food from the mouth into the stomach. There are two types that can occur. During the oral pharyngeal phase of swallowing, normally the mouth and tongue will propel the food bolus through the pharynx into the esophagus and the epiglottis will prevent food from entering into the airway. Oral pharyngeal dysphagia will inhibit the transfer of food from the mouth and pharynx to the esophagus. Typically, this is caused by a neuromuscular disorder. Um, this can be caused um, by the effects of a stroke or disease like ALS. Esophageal phase dysphagia refers to an interruption in peristalsis that moves a food bolus through the esophagus. Esophageal phase dysphagia
is characterized by an inability to pass materials through the esophageal lumen and into the stomach. This type of dysphagia can be caused by an obstruction in the esophagus or a motility disorder. The symptoms of oral pharyngeal dysphagia include inability to initiate swallowing, coughing during or after swallowing, nasal regurgitation in which um, food comes through your nose, bad breath, even a wet voice. Somebody might have a lot, sound like they have a lot of phlegm in their lungs or throat. Some causes of oral pharyngeal dysphagia listed in Table 17-2 of your book include Alzheimer's disease in its advanced stages, ALS, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, a brain injury from an accident or a stroke, and certain um, genetic diseases like cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, and there are a number of um, diseases that people tend to get when they're older, like Parkinson, that can interrupt the ability to swallow. Esophageal dysphagia can be caused by achalasia which is a condition in which nerve cells of the esophagus degenerate um, for reasons that are unknown. Esophageal cancer or esophageal spasms can cause dysphagia as well as um, compression from a tumor, even an enlarged thyroid gland. Scleroderma is a connective tissue disorder. People don't live very long. Or structure, which is inflammation, scarring, or a congenital abnormality in, esoph in the esophageal tissues. You can click the link here or the one that is posted in Moodle to view the documentary Swallow, which is 15 minutes and highlights individuals who are experiencing dysphagia. Dysphagia can contribute to nutrition problems like dehydration. Um, aspiration is a condition in which food goes into the airway. Uh, food can obstruct the airway or cause pneumonia while it's in the lungs. Um, it can actually cause death. Malnutrition can occur um, if a person is unable to meet calorie and in protein needs, especially. And respiratory infections. If you are aspirating fluids and foods into your lung tissue, that puts you at risk for aspiration pneumonia. People who have dysphagia are often put on a dysphagia diet. Um, speech therapists speech pathologists are responsible for evaluating people with suspected dysphagia and making recommendations about the types of food, the consistency of food, and the consistency of beverages that will be best tolerated based on their evaluation. Let's take a look at some of the different dysphagia diets. There are three levels to a diet called the National Dysphagia Diet. Level one is a puree diet. If you take a look at the picture on the right, um, if someone was hospitalized or even at home on a puree diet, um, they would be required to puree all foods, meatloaf, rolls, carrots, peas, whatever. Um, so it's like baby food. This is appropriate for people who have moderate to severe dysphagia. Um, 
and people who have poor oral or chewing ability. The picture at the bottom on the left side shows um, food molds, which can be used to enhance acceptance of a pureed diet. Some individuals uh, have a lot of trouble following a pureed diet, and um, you know, a lot of people would cheat. Um, in the hospital, bring uh, family members would bring in food that was not appropriate. Level two describes a mechanically altered diet that may include soft foods and gravies with meat. Typically, this is prescribed for mild to moderate dysphagia. Level three is dysphagia advanced and typically reserved for mild dysphagia. Picture on the right um, shows a young boy getting evaluated by speech therapy. Um, watch the documentary and you can see how cool, um, you can see all the muscles and tissues moving in the throat um, with this device that's atta attached to this young man. Dysphagia or difficulty swallowing can require someone to alter the liquid consistencies that they drink. A lot of people who have had a stroke that affects the nerves involved in swallowing cannot tolerate thin liquids. Even you as a healthy, able-bodied adult may have trouble at time or have um, coughed up thin liquids and felt as if they went down the wrong pipe. Um, people who have dysphagia have to be evaluated to see the type of consistency liquid that they're less likely to choke from. Okay, liquids can be nectar like, which is pictured at the bottom left, honey like, which is the consistency of honey, or spoon like or pudding thick, where it is the consistency of pudding and does not fall off the spoon. So depending on the degree of damage you have going on uh, with your swallowing function, that is going to determine which type of liquid consistency you can tolerate. So if somebody's on a honey-like liquid consistency and they're given thin liquids, it increases their risk of choking and increases their risk of death. When I worked in the hospital, family members didn't always understand the changes in consistency of foods and would bring outside food like Popeyes and whatnot um, which was not uh, the proper consistency, okay? In order to achieve the appropriate consistency liquids, there are gel thickeners available. Um, they come in packets that look like ketchup packets. Um, and there are powder thickeners, the gels tend to provide a better experience and a more stable consistency than the powders. There all are alternative feeding strategies that uh, can be employed for people with dysphagia, which may include um, changing the head and neck position while eating and drinking. Exercises can also be prescribed by speech pathology to strengthen the jaws, tongue, or larynx and new swallowing methods can be taught. Here is an esophageal stricture due to reflux of material into the esophagus. The next upper GI disorder is gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. GERD is characterized by the backflow of stomach contents that are acidic into the esophagus. The stomach has a very thick mucus layer that protects it from the very acidic hydrochloric acid that's secreted there. However, your esophagus has a mucus layer, but it's not nearly as hardy or sturdy, sturdy as the one in your stomach. Um, so, gastroesophageal reflux disease can cause things like um, irritation, reddening, strictures, which you saw in the previous slide. Um, 
Some symptoms when reflux does occur may include heartburn. Causes of gastroesophageal reflux disease are vary. Um, there's a huge list um, in your textbook, but generally it's caused by a weak lower esophageal sphincter muscle. Remember in chapter two with digestion and absorption, we talked about the sphincter that separates the esophagus from the stomach. When the sphincter fails to close, it can allow the backflow of these acidic contents into your esophagus and cause quite a bit of damage. GERD is often seen in people who are obese, pregnant, or people who have what's called a hiatal hernia. Um, and I will show you what that looks like very soon. Here we go. All right, so reflux you see in the first picture of the lady is when the lower esophageal sphincter fails to close, allowing acidic contents to backflow into the esophagus, causing heartburn. It is felt in the heart area. Normally, that does not happen. With a hiatal hernia, part of the stomach is actually protruding above the diaphragm muscle. And so you have the stomach herniating into the esophagus. There are a number of conditions and substances listed that are associated with esophageal reflux. Some substances act to weaken the lower esophageal sphincter and some increase pressure within the stomach. Substances that tend to weaken the lower esophageal sphincter, causing it to um, not close all the way, include alcohol, a certain anticholinergic drug, like Parkinson's medications, they block the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Benadryl has some anticholinergic activity. Um, antihistamines like Benadryl, um, caffeinated beverages, calcium channel blockers, which are um, used in the treatment of certain cardiovascular conditions, chocolate, cigarette smoking, certain types of anti-anxiety drugs like the benzodiazepine, diazepam, commonly known as Valium, estrogen and progesterone, so if you're on uh, synthetic hormones for whatever reason, um, you may experience uh, increased reflux. Peppermint and spearmint and also certain types of antidepressants can lower or weaken the lower esophageal sphincter, I should say. There are conditions and substances that can increase pressure within the stomach and make reflux worse, wearing tight clothes, being pregnant, um, carrying a lot of excess weight in the abdominal area, or having abdominal obesity, lifting heavy objects, eating large meals, laying down after eating a meal, um, bending over. And there's a condition called ascites that's commonly seen in people who drink too much and end up with liver cirrhosis. Um, what happens is there is a drop in necessary blood proteins that cause fluids to accumulate in the abdominal cavity where they're not supposed to be. The consequences of GERD can include damage to the esophagus, which is called reflux esophagitis, ulcers, dysphagia. I had a friend who was on antibiotics for a period of time. One of them got lodged in her esophagus. She did not know about it. This particular type of antibiotic um, actually eroded um, her esophageal tissue. She had dysphagia for a while. Um, she would tear up whenever she was drinking water. So it was serious, pretty serious. Um, she got it removed and she's okay now. Um, pulmonary disease. Um, due to aspiration 
of um, substances can occur. So you can have risk of aspiration pneumonia with GERD. Um, Barrett's esophagus refers to a condition of esophagus mm -hmm. where the tissues have been altered. Okay, you can see the normal esophageal mucosa at the top left picture. Under the bottom of that, you see Barrett's mucosa. This is the way Barrett's esophagus looks. It's dull, the tissue texture has changed. And you can see an esophageal tumor, also known as an esophageal adenocarcinoma, um, within the esophageal space. That are, there are a number of recommendations for treating GERD. The objective is to alleviate symptoms and facilitate healing of the esophageal tissue. Um, this can be achieved with acid suppressing drugs combined with lifestyle changes, eating small frequent meals, Acid suppressing drugs like proton pump inhibitors, an example would be Nexium, reduces the amount of acid that's secreted in the stomach. Histamine 2 receptor blockers also have some acid reducing properties. Surgery can include a fundoplication or um, can include dilating the esophagus. Take a look at the case study in box 17-7. The duplication on pair of hiatal hernia is shown here. The stomach is used to anchor um, it in place below the diaphragm. Other conditions that may require nutritional management and that affect the upper gastrointestinal system may include dyspepsia, nausea and vomiting, gastritis, and peptic ulcers. Okay. So we're going to talk briefly about each one of these conditions and how it can be managed from a nutrition standpoint. Okay, dyspepsia refers to symptoms of pain or discomfort in the upper abdominal area. It's caused by various medical conditions. Um, it is a symptom, not a disease. Medications and dietary supplements can be a cause of dyspepsia. If you're taking um, mineral supplements on an empty stomach, um, you're likely to have dyspepsia. Um, certain formulations of supplements that are sold over the counter um, are not compatible with um, gastrointestinal health. Okay, so be careful. Potential uh, food intolerances that may um, occur with dyspepsia uh, can be remedied by possibly avoiding fatty or highly spiced foods, avoiding the specific foods you believe to be trigger symptoms, and it's recommended that you consume small but frequent meals. Not eating never helps a situation. So try to find a way to get some calories in, uh, whatever you're dealing with, whether it's from Boost or Ensure. Bloating and stomach gas can occur if you chew a lot of gum, smoke cigarettes, you eat faster, you drink a lot of carbonated beverages. Drinking out of a straw can also increase the amount of, or does increase the amount of air that's in your GI tract and you will either burp it out or it'll come out the other way. Other remedies for dyspepsia include um, well-cooked foods, things that are lightly seasoned, the atmosphere in which you eat. Okay, don't try to eat in your car. Um, are you rushing, trying to work through lunch? And eliminate foods that trigger symptoms. Um, see a doctor if you have uh, symptoms lasting for more than a few days. Um, nausea and vomiting um, often accompanies other illnesses, okay? And that requires or can be managed with some nutrition recommendations. Um, the underlying cause always needs to be identified, okay? 
um, but people need calories at regular intervals. It aids in healing. Nausea and vomiting can be a side effect of many medications. There are a lot of medications to treat nausea and vomiting as well. Antiemetics are a class of drugs mentioned in your textbook that decrease vomiting in individuals. Um, if you have a lot of vomiting and lose a lot of fluid, you're going to need um, your hydration status restored and you're going to need electrolytes restored. Prolonged vomiting can lead to electrolyte imbalances. It can also damage your esophagus and your teeth. Remember that you have very acidic contents in your stomach and if you're vomiting those acidic contents um, a lot, it's really going to cause some damage to tissues um, that are not supposed to be exposed to stomach acid. So the nutrition treatment of nausea and vomiting um, include finding and correcting the underlying cause, restoring hydration, taking medication with food, and possibly taking a suppressive medication. Okay, then that will be up to your doctor. In cases of intractable vomiting, which refers to vomiting that is hard to control and not easily treated, how do you get appropriate calories into that person? Well, in cases like that, artificial nutrition, which is called parenteral nutrition, is warranted. Small meals can be helpful in managing nausea and vomiting, consuming beverages between meals. Um, some people find that drinking cold water on an empty stomach causes nausea. Okay, so maybe try drinking uh, water at room temperature. Dry starchy foods can help uh, for some reason. With uh, when I feel nauseated, um, kettle cooked potato chips, low fat from Lay's are my go to. Um, fatty, spicy, or strong smelling or hot foods may be less tolerated while experiencing nausea and vomiting. Gastritis is a condition that can be caused by other illnesses. There's acute gastritis and chronic gastritis. This often occurs um, to some extent in people who have GERD. Gastritis refers to inflammation of the gastric lining. It can be acute, meaning it has a sudden onset. It is caused by irritating substances usually or treatments that damage the gastric mucosa. Chronic cases can be caused by um, long-term non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use, also called NSAIDs. NSAIDs include aspirin, Aleve, Motrin, And these can damage the lining of your GI tract if you use them long term. Autoimmune diseases can be the cause of chronic cases of gastritis. Um, some people with Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune disease in which your body's own immune cells attacks your gastrointestinal tract. That is associated with chronic gastritis. And um, this picture here shows normal versus irritated gastric tissue. Potential causes of gastritis are listed um, and classified in Table 17-5. Some chemical substances that will irritate your stomach include alcohol, okay? Cancer chemotherapy, right, can really wreak havoc on your GI tract. Um, some of the newer camp Chemotherapies, however, don't necessarily affect the GI system as much as they used to in the past. So what I'm saying is cancer treatments have gotten better. Um, we talked about drugs like NSAIDs, especially aspirin, and the ingestion of uh, toxins or corrosive materials. Some infections that are related to gastritis include Helicobacter pylori, 
also known as H. pylori. This is the most common infectious cause of gastritis. Okay, Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria that is present in the stomachs of many people. And whenever your immune system is unable to balance the good bacteria with the bad bacteria in your GI tract, um, you are at risk for bacterial overgrowth, all right? With, um, it could be a fungus like Candida albicans, a parasite, or a viral infection like cytomegalovirus. So, um, internal causes may include, like I mentioned, autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease. Um, there's a condition called bile reflux that occur and damage um, the stomach. Um, severe stress. If you're under severe stress for a prolonged period of time, it's going to alter your stress hormones and decrease the immune system's ability to fight infection and put you at risk for bacterial or other infectious overgrowth. Foreign bodies, high salt intake, and radiation are other causes. When gastric secretory functions are disrupted, it means there is less gastric acid available. Um, gastric acid is necessary in digestion and especially in the absorption of the mineral iron and the vitamin B12. Having too low hydrochloric acid or absent hydrochloric acid in the stomach is called hypochloridia or achloridia. Hypochloridia means low hydrochloric acid, while achloridia means the absence of hydrochloric acid. We need hydrochloric acid for vitamin B12 to bond to the protein intrinsic factor, which is released by the stomach. So again, vitamin B12 must join with intrinsic factor in the stomach at an appropriate pH um, so that it can be carried through the small intestine and absorbed in the ileum. Um, avoid irritating foods and beverages uh, if you have gastritis and iron or B12 supplements may be recommended. If B12 supplements are recommended and a person has pernicious anemia, those uh, supplements are going to need to be sublingual, meaning that they dissolve under your tongue and get absorbed directly into the bloodstream um, from your mouth, or it will be by an intramuscular injection where you have to get a prescription and go to the pharmacy and they'll give you some needles. Peptic ulcer disease describes a condition in which ulcers develop in the gastrointestinal mucosa. Peptic ulcers are associated with certain factors. H. pylori infection or overgrowth of Helicobacter pylori is found to be present in 30 to 60 percent of people with gastric ulcers and in 70 to 90 percent of people with duodenal ulcers. NSAIDs tend to damage the lining of the GI tract long term. Smoking damages GI tissue as well as uh, psychological stress can increase your risk of developing an ulcer. Um, if you are under psychological stress, it may contribute to an increase in certain hormones or um, imbalance of hormones that cause your body to metabolize proteins differently. Okay, not in a good way. The symptoms of having a peptic ulcer can range from asymptomatic to having burning, gnawing pains in your stomach that makes it difficult to function. Ulcers can go into remission and recur, you know, wake up every few weeks or months in response to um, 
gastric irritation or psychological stress or overgrowth of the helicobacter pylori bacteria. Drug therapies may include discontinuing NSAIDs, especially aspirin, or adding a drug for um, the reduction of stomach acid or the repair of gastrointestinal tissue like Nexium or Protonix. Antibiotics may be prescribed for H. pylori and antisecretory drugs like the proton pump inhibitor Nexium decreases secretion of um, acid which can, which can irritate ulcers. The goals of peptic ulcer disease include correcting nutrient deficiencies if any are necessary and also encouraging dietary and lifestyle practices that will minimize symptoms. Some drug therapies for peptic ulcers may include the addition of antibiotics, the addition of anti-secretory agents. There's some bismuth preparations. An example of a bismuth preparation is Pepto-Bismol. Pepto-Bismol does affect some people's lower GI tract, however, in um, negative ways. It can cause black stool, for example. Um, sucrophate is available in a pill or liquid form and has um, the ability to help heal gastrointestinal irritations or erosions. Avoid irritating foods and avoid large amounts. Gastric surgery, a very interesting topic. It includes surgeries for uh, weight loss, but gastric surgery refers to surgery that is done on the stomach. People refer to gastric surgery as surgery done on the intestines, although that is not technically correct. A gastrectomy is defined as removal of part or all of the stomach. So a gastrectomy can be partial or total. A person may need to have his entire stomach removed if it's diseased with cancer, um, which I have seen. Some people have genes that promote the development of stomach cancer. And um, I saw a family of individuals with this gene who opted to have um, total gastrectomies, okay? Um, partial gastrectomy refers to when only part of the stomach is removed. And a bypass refers to when the remaining portion of the intestine is attached to the stomach. Your textbook has a figure that shows different gastrectomy procedures. This is figure 17-4. The two pictures on the right show partial gastrectomies. Right? In a partial gastrectomy, part of the stomach is removed. In these particular pictures, the first picture shows you a gastroduodenostomy. Okay, the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. In a gastroduodenostomy, part of the stomach is removed and the duodenum is attached to the remaining part of the stomach. It's important to note that with gastric surgeries that involve removal of the pyloric sphincter, Okay, recall from chapter two, you have a pyloric sphincter that regulates the flow of chyme from the stomach into the small intestine. Um, people who have had gastric surgery that uh, removes the pyloric sphincter have to change their eating habits because food now rushes through the GI tract and it increases malabsorption. So you're not absorbing as many nutrients from your food. Um, with uh, Surgery that's done for weight loss, that is the intent, okay, for you to malabsorb calories. But this often requires um, additional supplementation with vitamin B12. Okay, the second picture shows a gastrojejunostomy with a blind loop. With this procedure, part of the stomach is removed 
and the jejunum, which is the middle portion of your small intestine, is attached to the remaining part of the stomach. This allows the gallbladder and the pancreas to release enzymes into the duodenum steel but they have less opportunity to mix with those enzymes. A total gastrectomy involves removing the entire stomach and attaching the esophagus to the intestine and again requires lifestyle changes. This is a partial gastrectomy called a sleeve gastrectomy. The term sleeve refers to the fact that just um, a banana peel portion is left and uh, 80 to 90 percent of the stomach is removed. This can be effective in um, obese people wanting to lose weight. It will reduce the amount that you can consume at one time and it still allows for you to be able to control the flow of food from the stomach into the small intestine because this procedure leaves the pyloric sphincter there. After gastric surgery, um, it's difficult for many people to meet their nutrition needs. So the goal of nutrition care becomes um, meeting energy and other nutrient needs. Okay, gastric surgery um, after coming out of it may require uh, intravenous feeding. We talked about parenteral nutrition a little earlier in the lecture um, and nothing by mouth that is NPO, nil per os. This can go from NPO with intravenous feedings to um, clear liquids which may include water and broth um, which can be, be advanced to liquid meals, uh, sugar-free liquid meals, preferably things like Bucerna or Boost or um, small doses of uh, fluid that have calories and protein that can be consumed um, throughout the day in, in an effort to help uh, meet nutrition needs. And then solids um, after a time can be incorporated into the diet, but the remaining part of the stomach usually can hold only about one to two ounces of food. And so it is recommended that people consume liquids in between meals instead of with meals. Um, getting enough calories is um, necessary for wound healing and to keep you out of negative uh, metabolic stress from hormonal imbalances. So what happens with a gastrectomy is um, the stomach emptying rate increases. So food is allowed to go more freely um, through the gastrointestinal tract that leaves less time for enzymes to interact with chyme and less nutrients are broken down and absorbed. Small meals are recommended with consuming the protein containing foods first to make sure that you are meeting your protein needs. Um, it can be a struggle for individuals um, within the days and weeks after surgery adjusting to their new gastrointestinal system and how it's functioning. Um, I have seen cases where patients have uh, died from malnutrition after gas, um, gastric bypass surgery. Okay, dumping syndrome is a syndrome that can be caused by gastric surgery. Um, dumping syndrome results um, due to rapid gastric emptying where your pyloric sphincter is either not there or not functioning properly. Okay, so the flow of food um, is not under any type of control 
Um, this leads to diarrhea. You can also have some neurological symptoms. You may experience a fast heart rate, sweating, nausea, diarrhea, or vomiting. Um, with sugar, um, sugar mates, foods and beverages more osmolar. So they're hyperosmolar, meaning that the concentration is much higher than the concentration of our normal tissues. And so we are less likely to tolerate it because it is hyperosmolar. The symptoms of dumping syndrome are outlined in table 17-7 in your textbook. With early dumping syndrome, this refers to um, symptoms that occur within 30 minutes after consuming food. Abdominal cramps, bloating, diarrhea can occur just like, you know, if you had lactose intolerance, okay? Essentially what you have is undigested food moving quickly through your body. Uh, flushing and sweating, like headedness can occur, nausea, vomiting, rapid heartbeat, even feeling weak or faint. Late dumping syndrome symptoms occur between one to three hours after eating and can include um, neurological symptoms like anxiety, confusion, can also cause headaches, dizziness, hunger, palpitation, sweating, and even feeling faint. Um, there are a number of nutrition problems that can follow gastrectomy. Like I said, um, some people, you know, and people die less from um, gastric surgery these days in 2019 um, than they did in the past, okay? Some nutrition problems that uh, people may experience include food avoidance because it's uncomfortable to eat, you've experienced dumping syndrome, and so um, you're reluctant to put food in your body. So that causes malnutrition. That does not help with the healing process, okay? That does not help with mental and emotional well-being. We need vitamins, minerals, um, phytochemicals, fiber in order to um, do our best, feel our best. Fat malabsorption often occurs because um, recall that fat molecules and our fat soluble vitamins require bile and requires mixing with pancreatic lipase in order to be digested. Um, a gastrectomy decreases the amount of time that bile and enzymes have to interact with fat. And so you get less fat absorption and along with that less fat soluble, fat -soluble vitamin absorption. Um, bone disease can occur from osteoporosis or osteomalacia. Osteoporosis refers to porous bones and osteomalacia refers to softening of the bones. Usually it precedes osteoporosis. Other um, things that may happen include anemias. Uh, people tend to have problems with vitamin B12 and need a supplement lifelong after a gastrectomy oftentimes. Um, iron levels need to be monitored as well as um, folate and a multi vitamin mineral supplement is typically recommended on a daily basis. Bariatric surgery is most effective and durable in treating morbid obesity. Okay, there are criteria for candidates of bariatric surgery. Usually um, your BMI must be over 40 or if you have a BMI between 35 and 40, which is still categorically obese, um, and you have an accompanying condition like osteoarthritis or hypertension or type 2 diabetes or any of those conditions that usually occur with obesity, then that makes you a candidate. Uh, patients should have attempted a variety of non-surgical weight loss measures. Um, if you have cable and watch TLC, um, there's a show called My 600 Pound Life and there's a doctor, now Zord, Zordon there in uh, Houston, who performs um, bariatric surgery on morbidly obese candidates. And, you know, he requires the candidate to prove that they're capable of changing their lifestyle before approving them for surgery. So the 
Bariatric surgical procedures can be seen here summarized. Gastric bypass, okay, refers to the creation of a small stomach pouch, right? And then that stomach pouch is co connected directly to the jejunum. Okay, this is a gastric duodenostomy. Gastric banding is a procedure, um, good picture in your book, in which an inflatable band is placed around the uppermost portion of the stomach. It can be um, tightened or loosened um, with saline through a port that is placed um, in the abdominal wall. A sleeve gastrectomy you saw um, leaves a portion of the stomach um, that can hold three to five ounces, um, depending on how much the surgeon takes out. A sleeve gastrectomy can be done and then converted to a gastric bypass, in which part of the stomach is removed and then connected to the jejunum. If you compare gastric banding to um, gastric bypass surgery, um, the one that has the most success in reducing comorbid conditions um, is gastric bypass. Gastric banding is reversible. Mm. Here's a partial gastrectomy or sleeve gastrectomy. Here are some uh, gastric bypass procedures that can be done for severe obesity. This is figure 17-5. The first picture shows a gastric bypass operation in which a very small um, stomach pouch is made and the small intestine, specifically the jejunum, which is the middle part of the small intestine, is att attached to the remaining pouch. Um, the middle picture shows a gastric band. And this is used to create a small gastric pouch and the band can be tightened or loosened very easily um, through a gastric port with uh, saline. In the gastric um, sleeve gastrectomy, most of the stomach is removed and the rest is stapled together. After bariatric surgery, it becomes very important to meet energy and protein needs. The objectives for nutrition care include maximizing and maintaining weight loss, ensuring appropriate nutrient intakes, maintaining hydration, and avoiding complications. So there are a lot of things that um, patients have to get used to in terms of their eating habits. Small portions of food are required if you eat um, a lot of food at one time or you're going to feel sick, okay? And liquids should be consumed separately so as, not, so as to not fill the remaining pouch with too much of something that is low in protein, especially. The recommendations for protein range from 1 to 1 1.5 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight per day. Your ideal body weight is based off of your height. Mineral supplementation and vitamin supplementation is recommended, usually B12, um, vitamin D, calcium, and iron. People have to be careful about the types of food they consume, make sure they're chewing appropriately so as to avoid some type of obstruction within the GI tract. And avoiding high sugar meals is important because sugar tends to be hyperosmolar and moves through our GI tract very quickly. Post-bariatric surgery concerns include um, common complaints that um, may include nausea, vomiting, and constipation. Um, People may have long-term fat malabsorption, bone disease due to um, decreased ability to meet vitamin D and calcium needs, and anemias. So it's very important to pay attention to nutrition. 
Rapid late weight loss in individuals increases the risk for gallbladder disease and will result in excess skin that may need to be removed. If you have a lot of excess skin, it can pull on your organs, right? And death can occur. The nutrition and practice section focuses on oral health. Oral health can impact nutrition if um, you have dental disease to an extent that it affects your ability to consume foods or beverages. Take a look at the nutrition and practice section. Dental bacteria has been implicated or connected to heart disease. So oral health may be more important um, than just a pretty smile, okay? So let me know if you have any questions.